Neil Diamond's September Morn here on Gateway 97.8. You're listening to Good Afternoon with me, Yvonne, and my very, very special guest, Sidra Naim, the teacher and lecturer and specialist on the subject of Islam. Sidra that's not an adequate introduction by any means because you're involved with so many people uh, and really are such a valuable part of the Essex community. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your involvement in, 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 in the community. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you very much. I feel very privileged that you've invited me again onto the programme. Um, I'm a teacher and lecturer, like you said. Uh, I work in a mainstream school in Brentwood. And um, apart from that, I do lots and lots of community work. I'm part of three interfaith forums. I'm also um, part of SACRE, which uh, stands for the Standing Advisory Council of Religious Education. And um, I'm the Islamic representative on there. And what we do is we write curriculums for schools. So I wrote the curriculum for Essex. And because of that, um, profession. I'm, I go to lots of schools, do lots of talks on Islam. I'm also an Islamic advisor for Essex Police, uh, Essex Fire Service, Essex County Council and it's through the roles within the Interfaith Forum I get called to do lots of talks in universities, colleges, everywhere really and that's what brought me here as well. Yes, it, it, it's a fascinating in, involvement and you've got an amazing capacity to make your faith very real, very meaningful and very understandable. It's a gift that a lot of people don't have because for many in this country I guess Islam is seen as something to be afraid of. <laughs> we see reports in the news about a lot of young Muslim guys from wherever uh, crowding across Europe and heading towards Calais or whatever, mm -hmm. and get worried about them, feel threatened. Should we? I don't think there's anything to be frightened about. I think um, I explained in the last programme that the word phobia, which is attached to Islam, actually means fear, and that's what causes the fear. The word Islamophobia is the wrong word, really, to use. And also, you know, a lot of the media is all geared up against Islam, and I think that's what puts the fear in people. The more Muslims you get to know, the more you realise that we're all humans at the end of the day. And there's no religion really on this earth that promotes extremism or terrorism. All religions are for the good of humanity. And all religions promote good, not bad. But and if we remember course, that. But of course, you know full well that the answer uh, that will be thrown at you is what about the jihadis, what about ISIS? Mm -hmm. They're not practising Muslims in my eyes at all. They're not practicing Muslims because a lot of the things they're doing are not um, written within Islam to be done. So killing isn't allowed. Killing of innocent people is not allowed. Um, if we kill one person, it's like killing the whole of mankind. And a lot of the other things they're doing, none of them um, reflect Islam at all under any circumstance. And we ourselves are appalled by what we see when we hear the news and we feel very saddened by what is happening out there. And yet, of course, uh, all Muslims are to some extent tainted in the eyes of the rest of the world by the claims of these people. Yes, I think that's because they actually say themselves they're doing it in the name of Islam and then everybody thinks that's the religion but uh, practicing Muslims will tell you that's not what's in the religion. And I think that there's millions and millions of Muslims in the world, whereas th this ISIS and this terrorist jihadists, they're only a minority, really, of the millions that we have got. So if it's the, other, the rest of the millions we look at, then that should give us an idea that not all Muslims can be the same. How is it, do you think, that they are able to recruit people from... Western Europe, from, from the UK for example, why is it that people would go over to them? Uh, what is it that has made them disenchanted with life in this country? I think that the people that they're targeting, first of all, don't know anything about their religion. 
and they're brainwashed. I don't know, obviously, what they're saying to them, uh, but the people who are definitely joining them definitely haven't read or understood the scriptures, the Islamic scriptures, the Quran, the, the, the Sunnah, the Hadith, um, which is the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They haven't understood the message properly. And I think what ISIS use are, um, which is I think what media can do as well, they use certain parts of a whole verse and use that to their advantage. And I think that's where the problem is. And indeed, we are now in a state where good Muslims in this country it must be tearing their hair out with in despair at how youngsters can still get brainwashed. Yes, I think there's a big duty there from parents as well. It's very important that parents educate their children. Uh, don't leave it to others either, because how do you know what the others are saying to your children in terms of Islam? I think it's really important that parents keep an eye on um, what their children are being taught and themselves teach them according to their own ethics. See, the, the, the thing that sort of worries me a little is um, uh, that a lot of the families perhaps came from fairly restricted rural backgrounds. They, they came here. Um, their roots in their faith are probably pretty shallow. They were Muslims. They went through the, uh, all the required procedures. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah. They did it because everybody did it, yes. um, th without having a deep-rooted faith that they understand. And and f for them, they feel they're good Muslims, yet to you, as a well-educated, fully informed Muslim who understands the faith, you, you, you must find it very difficult to know how to communicate with them. It is difficult, but also faith says seek knowledge. And it also tells us in the Quran not to go by your gr your great your your ancestors your great grandfather's religion not to follow them, think the religion for yourself. That's very clear. So I think that you know parents, I think you're very right. There are lots of parents who are set in their ways according to what they were taught, which might not be necessarily the correct way. Um, it's still obligation to seek knowledge so that you can then teach your children the right way. And I think coming in this country, it's even more important to understand Islam in its originality rather than what you may have learnt, um, you know, back then. Um, also, I think nowadays it's much easier. There is, uh, you know, re th there's um, access to scriptures and the sayings of the Prophet even through the internet. Uh, in those days, you know, it was very hard. I mean, when I first starting te started teaching Islam, there was no internet. And I actually went and bought the nine volumes of the sayings of the Prophet and read the Quran, uh, first in English and then the explanation. It was very difficult. I, I actually looked in, you know, whatever topic I wanted to research, I had to manually research it. I think nowadays the children and the parents are very, very lucky. We've got internet at our hands and you can Google almost anything. And you can get the scriptures online, word mm. for word, with translation. So I think, um, you know, it's even more important nowadays, more than ever, that children know about their religion so that when they go to, um, you know, places for example, interfaith forums where they question, they know exactly what their religion says themselves rather than preaching the wrong thing. Yes, yeah, hugely important. But I just can't help thinking for people coming out of uh, a very different society, coming here into a British secular society, which is extremely secular, uh, and throughout most of the British society, religion doesn't seem to play a particularly important part. Uh, local authorities may have a civic service once a year. That would be a sort of a ritual thing that they go through, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And, and you, don't see, you don't get the impression that the faith, Christian faith, uh, in what was predominantly a Christian country, I guess, is followed particularly rigorously. 
the Church of England has been a very wide church. Uh, it means that your beliefs uh, can you can be accepted in that church, uh, even though your beliefs may be very variable. Islam doesn't seem quite like that. How can you, as a Muslim, find this country comfortable to exist in? I think that religion is a way of life, really, with Islam. It's a way of life, and it can um, you can incorporate it. You don't have to do it outside of your home, but definitely in the home, at least, you can incorporate your um, faith. Um, also, I think Islam is very strong in relation maybe to other religions, other monotheistic religions, because we still have the Quran in exactly the same uh, originality as it was revealed 1400 years ago, word for word, exactly the same message. There is no leeway in that way because the words are directly from God, Muslims believe, and, and, and we still have the Quran in its entirety, if you like, even today, to guide us. So I think that's where maybe other religions may have had leeway and you know can cross boundaries and things, whereas with Islam, we've still got that Quran. We haven't lost that yet. Is and it's a new religion as well. Islam is a fairly new religion. Um, only 1400 years ago it was revealed whereas if I look at Judaism and Christianity you know Judaism is over 3,000 years old so it's going to change isn't it throughout the time it's bound to yes it's being constantly interpreted yes um, and I guess that's something that perhaps will to a degree happen um, with Islam that the Quran will be looked at and interpreted and slightly different inferences uh, put on some of the words because sentences do not carry any meaning on their own. Mm -hmm. It's the meaning that was intended to be conveyed but that doesn't mean it was the meaning that was received. Uh, and yeah. the same words can say three or four different things. Yes, I think that the, the good thing about the Quran is first of all it's written in Arabic and all Muslims are asked to learn the Arabic language so that we can read the Quran in exactly the same message it was revealed in. By reading it in Arabic um, you can't go wrong really because when you translate it into other languages there are certain words in Arabic which you can't even, they don't even exist in English. Also, there's no versions of the Quran, which I think is different to the Bible. It's just one Quran. And even when you translate it, there's only a certain number of words you can change the original Arabic word to, because it's just one version. And the original, what you look at, which is the Arabic, it's from there always the translations are taken. So you're not translating it, for example, to, at, from Arabic to Greek, and then from Greek than to English and I think that's where you lose the true message of a scripture is when you translate it first into a different language then another one from that and then another one. We always translate directly from Arabic which means there's no leeway it's to a certain extent there's you know very few words that you can actually change. It's like looking in a thesaurus really if you wanted to change a word you'd look in the thesaurus and that's only a certain range of words really that you can use. Yes. Does that imply that Islam is somewhat rigid? I think that the good thing about Islam is that it's a very organised religion and I think that's what makes it so strong. I think that there are boundaries there definitely which stops any harm happening is all for the good of mankind and I think that it's a very organized religion I would definitely say that and also I feel that God made the world and and he knows what's best for the world if if the world modernizes it's because we ourselves as humans do it we modernize the world but the the word of the Quran is for all times so we change the world, but God doesn't change the world, we change it. So the words that he's revealed are for all times. But I suppose the counter to that is that um, in the Middle East, 1400 years ago, uh, there was a particular form of society that everybody knew at that particular time. 
move forward 1400 years and go to the United States totally different society different continent mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing the same yeah and what's very interesting though is that when you read the Quran you will not believe it's like you're reading it at the moment for modern times the problems we had 1400 years ago are exactly the same problems we've got today you know the the rules in the Quran all of those things are still there today and when you read the Quran it's like it's written for nowadays it's quite interesting in, in fact some things are actually more relevant to nowadays one thing that uh, strikes me in, the, in line of that response is that uh, this month is international LGBT uh, lesbian gay bi and trans uh, month, a sort of celebration of diversity. Where does Islam stand on this? Because I'm sure nobody thought of those definitions uh, 1400 years ago. Yes. Not all of them anyway. Uh, and where does Islam stand on this and, and why? Right, okay, the very first main point that I'll discuss is there's quite a few points I can discuss. Um, the Quran and the Bible and the Old Testament, the Torah, um, all of them specify a story about Sodom and Gomorrah, which was the story of uh, a nation who were practicing homosexuality. And it was Prophet Lot who came, um, who God sent as a messenger to stop all of that. People didn't stop. And then it's uh, clearly written in the Bible that there was acid rain, uh, brimstones fell from the sky. Um, there was a big calamity really to finish the whole nation so that is one of the things that a muslim would take uh, into consideration to decide you know that homosexuality is not what god intends um, also naturally if you look at adam and eve if god wanted um, two men or two women he would have made um, two women to begin with or two men he made adam and eve who were male and female um, and coming from there, naturally, if you look at a man and a woman, naturally they have children and that then multiplies the world. But if you look at a male and a male relationship or a female and a female relationship, um, you can't naturally have children. And then that brings me on to the next point. If you naturally look around the whole world, all animals, they're always in pairs. If you look at Noah's Ark, the story there, um, he took a male and a female into the ark. Why was that? So that they could then, um, you know, the, the progeny could then be multiplied. Um, if you naturally look at everything around you, there's always a pair, a male and a female. Even plants, there's a male part and a female part, even in a plant, for it to reproduce. So naturally looking around you, um, that's another really giveaway for Muslims, that the natural way is really for a male and a female, different genders, to mate and then have children. And then that coupled with the Sodom and Gomorrah story and Adam and Eve, all of that just makes sense really to Muslims. And so gay people, for example, are they excluded from Islam? Basically, what we would do is we would try and explain what I just said to you to them. And then if they don't, then that's up to them then, isn't it? That's their uh, own, you know, point of view. But as parents, we would definitely try and explain all these points to them and, and hope that they would understand. The Sodom and Gomorrah story is actually told within Sunday schools, um, even within churches at a very early age. So you'd just hope that children would understand themselves obviously you can't force um, uh, your opinion on others there's no compulsion in in religion and that's words actually from the Quran and we couldn't force our opinions on them but we could explain it in a nice way and then hope that they would understand mm. no that that figures on I do understand that very much so on that note, I think it's just about time to take a, a, a brief break and have a look and see what's uh, going on with the traffic and travel around here. And uh, thanks for your frank and forthright answers to all my questions. 
Uh, the only one parting shot, if I may, is when you say that if God, um, you know, God made male and female, um, if he wanted male and male or female and female, he'd have made things that way. I suppose it brings to mind the old joke, if he wanted us to fly, he'd have given us wings. I, I imagine you've heard that one. It's a silly story, but uh, yeah. leaving that aside, let's get on to have a look and see what's happening with the traffic and travel hereabouts and roundabouts, and pause for a brief break. And uh, looking at the travel desk... <sighs> Gateway 97.8 Travel. Yes, with uh, Apocalypse of Love, its last promise, our local artist for this hour. And if you'd like to feature as a local artist, don't hesitate to get in touch with us on unsigned at gateway978.com. Sidra Naim is my guest this afternoon. We're talking about Islam, life as a Muslim in this country, and some of the problems that uh, have been associated with uh, radicalization. Well, one of our Gateway members is working for an organization in London where her job is to spot or, or look for signs of radicalization in young people. How effective do you think this sort of action can be? Or do you think the responsibility lies within the family? I think, it, like I said before, it's parents do need to keep an eye on what's happening with their children. They need to know who their friends are, where they're going, uh, you know, how are they being taught Islam, that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, I agree that if there's any terrorist activity going on in the world, it needs to be reported in order for it to be stopped. That definitely should happen. But there is another side of the story as well where I feel a lot of Muslims I feel feel like they're being watched all the time. Uh, there's new prevent training which is happening throughout England, which I'm aware of. And I think that sometimes has been taken a little bit too far, you know, where children have just said very innocent things at school and then before you know it they've been, you know, at the police station. So I think there's pros and cons to everything and it's the limits that we need to look at. So, yes, I think terrorism should be reported if and when seen. Anything majorly suspicious. Tiny things could be just everyday conversation, really. Um, and parents, yes, definitely, they've got huge responsibility to keep an eye on their children. Very, very difficult for parents these days. After all, the kids have access to the internet, the World Wide Web. They can be in contact with anybody from anywhere who could be perhaps wanting to influence them adversely. And they can do this without the parents' knowledge. Yes. They can very easily uh, be in contact with a wider world without mm -hmm. the parents knowing. Mm -hmm. Because they're more computer literate, generally speaking, than their parents. Yes, but I think that there is um, ways you can. I mean, for example, the training that we do for parents in my job at, at work, um, it is to keep your child near you where you can see what he's doing, who he's talking with, um, who, who is he friends with on Facebook. You know, you can keep an eye on them still. Um, but, you know, they could access the internet from within the sitting room where you can see what they're doing. You can block off certain websites. It is possible. Um, iPhones, I know they can do what they like at school, but even iPhones, you can, you know, you're paying the bill probably as parents. You can keep an eye on what they're doing and what they're not. I think it is possible, definitely, mm. and, and uh, get to meet their friends, get them to bring their friends back for tea and things like that. Um, definitely in terms of Islamic education, you can definitely keep an eye on them. Where are you sending them? Who are they being taught by? And you know yes i mean we've certainly had some reports of uh, some uh, rather uh strange imams um people who've uh, been booted out of the country eventually uh, uh whose religious fervor uh would seem to have been founded on something other than the islam you talk about yes well you know that can happen really in any religion 
um, you know, uh, you know, for example, I know about lots of priests as well who have done all sorts. Um, I think that if they're following the religion, they wouldn't be doing anything bad. But people are people, humans, and it's the human nature really to to do bad things. So we can't paint everyone with the same picture, and we can't al always say that they're practicing Muslims. There's good and bad in every religion, and you know you can be a Muslim by name and still go about doing bad things. Uh, you know, just like you can be a Christian just by name, it doesn't mean you do everything the Bible tells you to or go to church, do all the things that the religion says. We hear an awful lot about the number of Muslims who've been freeing persecution in the Middle East and they've headed up towards Calais and the number of Christians who've gone over there uh, to Calais to provide aid. Why yes. aren't Muslims providing aid? They are providing aid. <laughs> they definitely are. And it's really interesting. One of my Christian friends, really lovely lady, uh, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, went to Calais to help all the Muslims there. And she came back and she said, I cannot believe how many Muslims I saw there. There were trucks, trucks, truckloads coming from all over areas, all over the world, um, coming to help the refugees. Um, definitely Chelmsford, uh, you know, near me, they are doing so much. Chelmsford Mosque, they are, um, at the moment as we speak, they are collecting bag loads of food, clothing, blankets to help um, the Syrians. Unfortunately, that's not what they're showing the news. So it looks like Muslims are ruthless, and they don't have any humanity in them and they're not helping. But within Muslims, we know every other day there's a collection. And in areas like London, all the charity shops have got adverts up in the windows. Um, they're all making collections for Calais. But only a real Muslim can tell you that, whereas the media will not tell you that. Do you think the, do you think the media is sort of institutionally biased. Yes, definitely. I mean, they found an ideal scapegoat, really, in Islam. Um, ridiculing Islam sells newspapers, sells, um, makes money, doesn't it? And increases the ratings of television programs. And bad sells, whereas good never does. If you look at pop stars, when you interview them, they're always very depressed about how the media have portrayed them to do affairs and all kinds of stuff they've portrayed about them. The drink and the drugs will get in, but a happy marriage that lasts for 25 years you will never see in the newspapers. Only the bad gossip, that is what will sell newspapers and television programmes. The ratings will go higher. Sadly, of course, you're absolutely right. Um, coming back to you in just a moment, but... Uh, but first. And back with Sidra Naim, my guest this afternoon, the teacher, the lecturer, the specialist on Islam, the lady who has been responsible for the uh, syllabus on Islam in Essex. She knows what it's all about. Now tell me, Sidra, what's, what, what's it like to be a Muslim in Britain at the moment? And what are, what are the sort of obligations that you have to carry out every day? Because I do get the impression that you've talked about Islam being a way of life, uh, that it rather does intrude on what for other people, non-Muslims, would be what they want to do. You know, you have certain duties and obligations. What was what all this? Yes, I don't think um, our religion gets in the way of anybody else at all under any circumstance. It's us and our religion, basically. It is a way of life, so everything that we do would live out Islam. Um, so, I mean, the main things at home, for example, we would try and do our five times daily prayer and um, fit those, fit all our household duties and other th jobs and things in between. 
Um, but it's not doesn't just stop at the five times prayer. For example, you know, uh, if we go out shopping, we might want to help an old person, open the door for them, help shopping for our neighbours, uh, pay a visit to our mum and dad, um, respect our parents. Everything really is that we do is focused around Islam in our daily lives, in all the good things that we do. Um, we might give a you know a couple of pounds charity uh, while we're out shopping, that kind of stuff. But in terms of at home, we would mainly do our five times prayer, which are obligatory, and in a way they organise our whole day because all our other duties neatly get slotted in between our five times prayer. Yes. And uh, does Islam require you to give to charity? Yes, they do, yes. Uh, Islam, um, it, at the time when Islam came, the rich people were really, really rich and the poor were really, really poor. So not, the rich were not giving any of their money or food or anything to the poor. There was no concept of even understanding how the poor feel. And one of the pillars of Islam, which is one of the obligatory things, is to give 2.5% of your assets to those in need and once a year. And what that does is it redistributes the wealth in a society. So the rich become a little bit poorer and the poorer become a little bit more richer. I think it's personally a very good system. It distributes all the wealth and Muslims are actually the record breakers for giving the most amount of charity in the world, which you will never hear on the media. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right, you, you don't. That was one of the pillars. What yes. are the others? So the very first one is the actual belief in one God, because Islam came at a time when there was over 300 gods being worshipped, idols. So the very first um, pillar is the testimony of faith, and it's very similar to the Christian creed. One sentence which summarises our whole faith, and that is that there is only one God, Allah, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. We believe in all the prophets, all of the prophets mentioned in the Old Testament, um, including Jesus. And why we say Muhammad in that sentence is that by saying his name, we're acknowledging all the ones before because we believe he's the last prophet. So by saying his name, we're acknowledging all the prophets before him and also uh, accepting their rules and their books because each prophet came at a particular time and changed the rules or updated the rules according to what was happening on the land. The second pillar I've already mentioned is the um, five prayers, the five daily prayers. Remember, people were not, at the time when Islam came, people were not worshipping God at all. They had comp completely forgotten God. They were either not worshipping God at all or remembering him or worshipping over 300 gods. So when Islam came, um, Muslims were told to pray five times a day. And in that way, we're remembering God the whole day from dawn till night. And it, that, in that way, we're remembering him the whole day. Um, the third one is charity, which I've already explained. Um, you know, money is the root of all evil. In a way, the more money you've got, the more you're going to delve into bad. Think of pop stars again, drugs and alcohol and all the rest. Um, and this actually keeps us moderate, really, in what we earn as well. I mean, a millionaire would have to end up giving out a million to charity. So I mentioned that already. The fourth one is fasting. I did mention um, the rich were really rich at the time when Islam came and the poor were really poor. And the rich had no concept whatsoever of how the poor even felt. So fasting, in a way, was prescribed so that we can feel how the poor feel. If we feel how the poor feel, we're more likely then to help them. So, and also fasting uh, takes on board all the previous prophets as well. Moses, for example, he fasted up on the mountain um, for 40 days when he was receiving his, the Ten Commandments. And Jesus also, we all know about Lent, for example, which is coming up where he fasted 40 days in the desert. So we carry on that tradition and we fast in the month the Quran was revealed, Ramadan. And For how long? It's for one month, and we eat a very big breakfast in the morning, um, just before, at dawn time. 
and then throughout the day we don't eat or drink anything and then at night we would have a very big three course meal mm. um, and in that way we're remembering we're feeling how the poor feel and then we're more likely to give them money for charity and clothes and all the un- other mm. hospitable stuff you could do and it makes us so grateful for the ma- for the food that we have which we have so much of in this We've country got one more minute Have we covered all the pillars yet? I've got one last one, and that's a summary of the faith. That's once-in-a-lifetime journey to Mecca, which is where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. And there's a big um, cube-like structure there, which we believe Abraham built for the worship of the one true God. So once in a lifetime, if we can financially afford it and physically fit enough, we would go and do pilgrimage, and it's called Hajj. Have you done Hajj? I have done Hajj. And I would honestly say it was the most life-changing experiences I've ever had in my life. Very spiritual. Sida, as always, you're a wonderful guest. Thank you so very much for coming and talking to us. And uh, uh, time for me to uh, have a look and see what's going on with the weather. And hopefully see you same time, same place. Next month. And yes, it's uh, bright and clear this afternoon. Temperature chilly, six degrees, and uh, not too much wind either. It's coming from the south, which makes it a little more pleasant.